Welcome. Thank you all for coming to our event this evening. We're delighted to welcome you to Poetics of a Home Festival, a digital Chinese diaspora poetry festival this autumn aims to connect and showcase the diverse works by established and emerging Anglophone poets writing across the Chinese diaspora. And thanks to Wasafiri Institute of English Studies, Oxford Brooks Poetry Centre and Arts Council England to support us. Live caption function is available for accessibility. And I'll be introducing our moderator, Dr. Lucien Lowe. Um, she is a senior lecturer in English lecture at uh, University of Liverpool. She's a co-founder with Dr. Alex uh, Tickle of the British Chinese Study Network and is working on a project on British Chinese cultural responses to racism. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for that um, warm introduction, Tin Hao, and thank you so much as well to Jenny, especially for, for all the hard work and putting such an amazing program of uh, events um, together for us. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm delighted to be here. I, I think the, um, the kind of uh, the burgeoning of British Chinese uh, writing is, is really something to be celebrated. And I'm, I'm so glad that this event is happening. Poetry is at the forefront of the development of, of, the, of the British Chinese um, literary, um, I guess, can, um, canon formation in some ways. Um, and, and you know it's 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 so important to kind of celebrate celebrate that with three amazing poets uh, today. So um, again, a warm welcome to everyone. Um, this evening's uh, poetry event um, focuses on the broad theme of cultural hybridity, um, and I'm really delighted to have three poets here today with me: Will Harris, Helen um, Bowell, um, Bowell, and. Jay Ying, <laughs> I've already screwed up on names. Um, and um, having read their poetry, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be moderating this event because um, cultural hybridity is so, so key to, I think, uh, the Chinese diaspora. Uh, the, I guess the, 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 um, it's, it's in, the, in the idea, the idea of diaspora is fundamental um, to, to hybridity. They, they kind of intersect with each other. Um, but I think all three poets, um, are writing against a common backdrop and, and that's something that we might discuss together um, yet with different styles and approaches so they're they're in various ways all kind of contesting confronting confounding what it means to be Chinese uh, in all its various facets and I was um, I was just kind of blown away by all the different kind of inflections of Chineseness and being Chinese um, the, the, the most obvious ones are cultural and linguistic but we also have the historical, the biological, the technological, even the arboreal, um, the trees signifying Chineseness, I thought was was particularly interesting um, and generational as well. Um, the kind of tensions between uh, what what gets inherited between generations. So I hope that our, our discussion today, not only between the poets themselves, but between um, all of you here and us, um, will kind of think through the crosshairs of, of all of those different um, manifestations of Chineseness. So um, I'll just say a little bit about um, the schedule for this evening. Um, I'll begin by uh, introducing uh, Will Harris and Will will read for uh, 15 minutes or so from his uh, collection of poems. And, and then I'll introduce Helen and Helen will read um, and we'll end with, with Jay. And then we'll have 15 minutes or so uh, for a conversation between the poets and myself. And then we'll turn things over to you uh, feel free to type things into the chat function or to just raise your hand um, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll ask you to uh, unmute and, and um, say your question or your comment uh, and feel free to address uh, any of the poets or all of them um, um, and, and I'm very happy to take questions and comments as well. Okay, so um, it's, it's a pleasure to be introducing uh, Will Harris. Uh, Will uh, is a London-based writer uh, he's the author of Rendang, uh, published by Granta in 2020, um, and his second book uh, is called Weather and Address. So welcome, Will, and thanks so much for being here. Ooh, I wasn't even muted. Hi. Um, glad I didn't make any embarrassing noises. Um, thank you so much, Lucien, and thank you, uh, Jenny, for putting on this whole event, and Jin Hao also for helping make this happen. Um, okay, I am just going to try and read these poems. Um, and I'm going to share my screen, partly because I guess it's easier 
to see and also it makes my face smaller which is less distracting okay um i'm gonna mostly read poems from rendang and then i'll read a couple of a couple of new ones towards the end um this poem uh yeah is about the film flash gordon which stars uh, an actor who I always assumed when I was a kid was a like, you know, an iconic Asian film star, but in fact was a man called Max von Sydow. Not Asian. Um, okay. Pathetic Earthlings. Planet Mongo is underdeveloped in certain respects. Most of its terrain is purple rock, but they do have hovercrafts and telepathy. So while you're flying from the Imperial Palace to visit your cousin beyond the purple rocks and the ice mound they call Phrygia, you can put a plastic halo over your head and think to your cousin, as the Mongo people say, and be talking to him as if you were inside each other's head or on hands free. Though impressive technologically, this has one defect. You can't refuse to take a telepathic call. Suddenly you're inside their head and they're inside of yours. And what if your cousin is in a bad mood or having sex with his wife or another woman or masturbating over something terrible? I have a cousin called Ming and people say I look like him, which is uncomfortable because though he may not be evil, he's done bad things. When I tell people this and say his name is Ming, they laugh because I assume it's such an evil sounding name. Ming doesn't wear red suits trimmed with gold, isn't bald, and doesn't have facial hair like a court jester's parted legs. But sometimes that's how I think of him too. And if even I can't help thinking of him like that, then maybe he couldn't help becoming kind of evil over time. I think to him, my hovercraft skimming over the purple wastes of planet Mongo, and enter his consciousness just as he sits down on the toilet. Malaria obsessed, the only decoration in his bathroom, a picture of his daughter he can't look at now without crying, wondering when it was his life turned so thoroughly fucking evil. He didn't start out wanting to be rich and powerful or to sleep with anyone other than his wife necessarily. I could be thinking to him more mercy than he would himself allow. We haven't spoken in nine years. Perhaps, like Emperor Ming, he's only sitting in his version of a palace eyebrows arched, tormenting, pathetic earthlings. I think to him, I really do, but you can never know for certain whose head you're in. Um, it was amazing thinking about that film as an adult and just the like absolute trip of it being called Planet Mongo, which hadn't even occurred to me at the time. Anyway, <laughs> um, lot to unpack. This is a kind of uh, sequence within the book called Glass Case, and they're all linked poems, or they're poems which I came to realize were linked in different ways. Um, and actually, when I think of this poem, I always think of, um, yeah, I think the, the title came out of uh, Sandy Palmer's a bit in her essay, Not a British Subject, where she talks about how as a person of color, you feel like you're vitrined. And I always thought that was such a good word, um, which is like, yeah, you always feel on display in a um, majority white country. Glass case. My granddad introduced me to shallots, which he would fry in butter with chopped potatoes. I wrote about this once and a friend said I'd made a fetish of the word shallot. Or was it a reference to the Lady of Shalom? When my granddad died, I thought that only suffering was real and happiness pains absence. I told myself that art should be like glass. When Hart Crane sings the silken skilled transmemberment song, his pained voice carries across or through unmaimed. No one should have to say they're sad. Reverend Flint's gift of his uncle's Dutch East Indian artifacts to the British Museum means that two of Sir Stamford Raffles' Wyang masks, collected during his time as governor of Java, sit behind a glass case in the Enlightenment Gallery. He lives on in them or through them. For counterpoint, they have been placed beside two mummified heads, one of which retains the bandaging that has corroded from the other. 
When mum first came to London, she waitressed at a Thai restaurant in Gantz Hill. She says the prawn toast would always slip off the plate as she made to set it down, and one day she spilled a whole plate on that guy who hosted Restoration. Over three decades later, Chinese Indonesians are still keeping their heads low. Neither China nor Indonesia is home. And here, as ever, the self must be embodied. Or like those, those oily sesame seed, Grace Jones's pink shirt embedded. Other mixed is what I tick in forms, though some drunk nights I theorize my own transmembered norms. What have you taken? What you have taken? I have taken nothing from you. Then I have taken nothing. What have you taken? What you have taken? What have I taken? What you have taken from me. Just as a little aside, I kind of like added fuck you to the British Museum. They made it incre incredibly difficult and expensive to use that image of that is so that's the wine mask that is in the Enlightenment Gallery, Enlightenment Gallery, room one of the British Museum. And yeah, I kind of actually, yeah, actually now I think about it, I really resent that in order to use that image, we actually did have to pay the British Museum to photograph, to take a new photograph of a stolen item. And they, all have, they also have something like 112 stolen um, masks, which are just in storage, which no one has ever seen. And that continually really pisses me off, especially because if you've been to the main um, museum in, um, the National Museum in Jakarta. It, it, there are, there's quite a lot of empty space there. Could probably, you know, probably, could probably use those masks. Okay. Um, scene change. A row of Georgian houses slopes down to a meadow filled with pretty little meadow flowers where you could forget these rolling barrows started life the stacks of corpses piled high with earth and stone that rotted back into the land and only after several generations growth grew to resemble what you might call scenic. Built by the Dutch in the century before last, I climb the high steps of the bell tower and taking in my hands the tongue, the clapper, ring too slowly at first, aware of my imposture, and then too quickly in a bid to compensate as it dings hollow across the square and down across the car polluted outskirts of the colony. Um, where I feel like I've been talking for a long time, so I'm maybe going to skip this poem, which is about visiting a mausoleum in, the, uh, in an area called Tangerang the outskirts of Jakarta, and also about how the Dutch are evil. So just, you know, that's the take home. So uh, I'll just move on to this one, which is probably more like relevant to Jay's and Helen's poems and some of the stuff we might talk about. After the quinine plant. The more he thought, the more thinking itself became a source of anxiety casting its green shade over him mid-sleep. Because of what he was and could not be, because of what he did not know he was. London, he knew. It was the other country in him he feared. The oak tree's unseen roots whose tendrils poked out mid-speech. Did you inhale diaspora? Did you choose cliché? No, he said, not knowingly. The more he thought, the more things came back to him. Like the myth of the great-great-grandmother who left Fujian on broken feet sometime in the late Qing dynasty. The myth of the living tree divided among her children who became many distinct seeds that when cashed became one currency. The more he thought, the more he had to move. And soon he found himself in Beijing, expecting the thud of recognition, but as in a dream he moved differently. Walking the hutongs at night, shop after shop, different but the same, he licked toffee apples and drank bubble tea, 
his feet never touching real earth. The more he thought, the more names appeared. Peckenbaru, Kotabaru, Chiang Mai, places whose names meant something new. And that was when he remembered the quinine plant, the poem he'd spent years writing and then abandoned. And he thought of the plant's long waxy leaves and white purplish flowers cultivated by the Dutch as a vaccine for malaria in the late 19th century, when his own Dutch great-great-grandfather worked at a quinine plant in Bandung. The more he thought, the more he needed to return to Peking University's gated campus, where age five he and his mum had lived for ten months. A guard stopped him at the gates to ask for ID, just as a man who looked like a spelt Santa Claus appeared and said he was a professor of economics. He vouched for him. The more he thought, the less he knew, and sitting beside the artificial lake, a part of him remembered it 25 years before, snowed under, white as swans down, the other part connecting nothing with nothing, as the sun set behind a plate of green smog. The more he thought, the more he came back to the quinine plant, as a way to make sense of his parents' relationship, as a kind of post-colonial romance, which made him its awkward postscript. The more he thought, the less he could extract some life-saving balm from the duress of history, without which, what was the point of poetry? The more he thought, the less order took the form of words to represent the slaughter his family escaped, the more he thought of buckets of fried chicken his uncle brought back from KFC when he worked there in Anaheim in the late 90s, his cousin already speaking perfect American. He saw his uncle's sweat-stained armpits as he praised Colonel Sanders, have more biscuits, have more gravy. The more he thought, the more he needed to purge himself through walking at night, inhaling tree pollen thrown into the air by recent rain. So he walked until his eyes were bleared, until he had to lie down on wet grass, dreaming of the pages of the quinine plant, buried in a green shade and grown tall with the blood of workers, a violent plant, which occasionally bore, bore small flowers that smelt of milk sweet and made white people salivate. Though unfortunately, they were poisonous. Thank you, and yeah, thanks to everyone who came and who's here. Sorry, not came. Uh, yeah, I'll should I just pass the mic straight over to Helen? Oh wait, no, you've got introduced her. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Will. That was that was wonderful, um, and. Um, you know, uh, right, right in the heart of so many post-colonial concerns as well. Um, <laughs> I love the reference to Raffles because I'm from Singapore. I went to Raffles Junior College, <laughs> um, so well, uh, got quite a lot to say about about Raffles there. Um, but um, yes, uh, thanks again, Will, um, and it's a pleasure to welcome Helen. Um, Helen Bowell is a, a poet and producer um, based in London. She's a co-director of Dead women poet society and a Ledbury poetry critic. Her debut pamphlet is forthcoming from Bad Betty Press and she works at, at the Poetry Society. Thanks so much for being here with us tonight, Helen. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks Lucienne and, and Jenny. Um, yeah, it's an honor. Like I feel like a little, little fish, big pond right now. <laughs> so um, yeah, I shall also share my screen and get started. It was interesting trying to pick poems uh, relevant to cultural hybridity um, and looking at some of the other events in this festival, I wonder if I would have picked the same poems no matter which event <laughs> I was doing um, because I don't know, there's, it's all bound up with everything else, isn't it? Um, but yes, let us, let us begin. Um, Maiming. Our Cantonese teacher tells us our parents' names, corrects the tone, guesses which Waiping it might be. Not the boy's name for your mother, surely. Ah, Waiping. How come you don't know your mother's name? My classmate knows it's Yale romanization. Like him, I know how to spell my mother's name, not how to say it. Yokwa, Yokwa, Yokwa. I can't even say my own middle name with certainty. Beautiful, bright. In English, it sounds like hurting, like I am maiming her tongue. Can't speak Cantonese, can I? It's no good. It's no good at all. <laughs> uh, but I do know this word. <laughs> Aya. It escaped me on the train 
when the clouds let fall their lakes. A ya, a shark cry, an ocean breath out, a smooth pebble skimming twice and sinking. Urban Dictionary claims saying it makes any situation better. Aya, my wife left me and my kids are on fire. Aya, she broke my car and my heart. One of my few Chinese tricks is to play this when least expected. Prove I can catch this breath when it's thrown. Aya, mum's favourite way of addressing me. What now? Aya, even dad knows it, its exasperated tone. Calls it when tea is spilt glass broken. Chinese is so full of ghosts, it probably expels evil spirits. Aya, aya. Sometimes I'm sure I hear the world, world whispering it, a Chinese breeze. Aya. Once I thought a colleague from the Wirral had panted it, bounding up the stairs, but no, he was just making a sound. On eggs. This is, well, this is interesting. I mean, I, this is very much like I, I don't know. I'm not very finished with this poem, but um, I, I, it's interesting. Maybe we can talk about this later. But in Will's book, um, Mixed Race Superman, he talks about um, not really realizing that he was sort of other until a certain age, and same um, on eggs. I thought I was white till I turned nineteen. Whitelisting a word means it'll always be allowed. People prefer brown eggs over white because they're thought to be healthier, but brown laying eggs, brown, brown egg laying hens cannibalize each other. Brown egg laying hens have their beaks mutilated. Brown egg laying hens live in detention centers. My white family, your white dog, my white friend said, Ginger Helen, Chinese Helen, eyes like egg whites, Chickens learn to cannibalize from each other. Chickens are shown to be self-aware. My relatives call my dad white ghost. He never says anything back. I wash my whites. I buy white eggs. I correct the camera's white balance, focusing on a fresh sheet. Um, shout out to the best transport system in the world, the MTR in Hong Kong. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is MTR high bun. <laughs> we queue to sit in tin snakes where the doors sing as they close. There is nothing here for me anymore, my mother says. Everything is metal, so sweat slides off stainless, colours can't fade. May the MTR run forever. The louder section is underwater, the stops drift apart. We are running faster than running and an octopus is paying. I grew up watching the flashing dots, naming the next stop aloud. Prince Edward, Chim Sha Cho. Always the same, except I got taller, got better clothes. Sure, there are other ways to cross the water. You might huff the star fairy's fumes, shout like ants on a washing machine, watch the tower blocks blink awake. But I could sing my future daughter to sleep with the closing door song. Please stand back from the doors. It's just a stupid in-joke with myself because I love to speak along with the train announcement. <laughs> um, another poem from Hong Kong. Yong Shu Wan Pier. We're walking the gangplank again bumping our suitcases over its yellow hyphens, the tang of aeroplane on the ceilings of our mouths. The workers are shouting, pulling the boat too, arms like rope. The air is filled with trolleys trundling and relatives hiing family home. Wow, how they've grown. Look what they've brought to eat. Now we're late for dinner with your sister, for a meal that will bridge the two years between you. Now it's morning and we're rushing to catch the 10.30. There is dim sum ahead, hours of tea and clean shopping centres. We sit by the opened windows, ask for the breeze and the engine's oily breath. Now we're waking our legs from the ferry for the dark walk into the hills and home. Our beds this time are in your mother's flat. Now they're in your childhood home. Now the farm's ex-pigsty, air-conditioned and new. Now we're hurrying back to the ferry in wedding clothes we're trying not to sweat, Mark. 
Your nephew's getting married, now your niece. The air feels like warm seawater. We drink it breathlessly like tea. Now we're early for the next boat because we missed the one before. We're never early on purpose. We're pulling Vita Soys from the vending machine and they taste like all our pink stationery. We're taking a deep look with our lungs, listening to the fishermen's whip cast, their deck chairs shuffling on the pier, their sips of Lipton iced tea. This is the photo I'm trying to take here by the bicycles peering over the edge. Uh, like Will, I think we must skip this one. <laughs> um, and I don't know, how long do I have? I haven't, I've not really been uh, paying attention to time. Lucy, and you've got- Helen, you've got, you've got um, um, five, 10 more minutes. So quite, quite ten. a while. Surely yeah. I don't have 10 more minutes. <laughs> but, um, Will, Will didn't quite get to, um, yeah, you've got, you've got 10 more minutes, uh, but obviously okay. don't, you know, take your time. Okay, well, I'll just whip through, I'll just whip through this one. Because <laughs> I think it said, I don't know, it talks about class a little bit, so that's maybe interesting to bring in. Um, respectable. My dad hates garlic and all that foreign stuff. He calls himself an inverted snob. I think he'd excuse himself if he met me somewhere. Poetry, not for me. Still, at Christmas, our family say, oh, that's posh, as if being given a hamper is a compliment. I used to think I was entitled to something because mum could buy just one bag of rice when she arrived, because dad grew up hiding from fights on the estate, by extension, by relation. My aunt and I have so little to say. I try to eat fewer avocados. I buy £12 breakfasts. I say, cafe. At the grammar school, I was told I was smarter than 90% of the population. I want climate protests. I want a house. What do I call myself? Why does it matter? Granddaughter of stolen peas, grandmother of PhDs. Look upon these calluses from cello playing and weep. My aunt likes being taken out for lunch, even if she does complain. Um, I've got a Mulan poem, as every, every Chinese person should. Uh, I said this, there's a, there's a BC poetry uh, Instagram, collective group thing um and we had a reading the other the other week and i say this and i would like to restate it for the record if there is a mulan poetry anthology i would like to be the editor <laughs> so just putting my hat in the ring if anyone wants to put in that arts council bid bring me up <laughs> um but yeah this one I, I was thinking a bit about um how um mulan is like this queer ancestor that we don't really necessarily think of her in that way um and it's interesting that out of all of the disney films i mean obviously mulan is is a, a myth separate from disney but out of all of the disney films it's really the queerest one where she's dressing up as a as a boy to yeah gen she's just a lot of gender bending and <laughs> shang just falling in love with with this person he thinks is a man um yeah to Mukhlan. Somewhere under Mao's rubble, your bones are dirt. Maybe magnolias grow where you lay, your namesake still shooting pink into the ground. They're still telling your story like it's straight. They want you bandaged in that pink dress, that short hair. They want you running dirty from tree to pond. They say you went home, swapped sword for pins. Bound mouth, not chest. I don't believe them. Men have plucked blossoms and told me I was one too. Said, look how hands snap pink into blue. But Jer Jer, our lineage is older than bees. There's always been more than one way to grow. Um, and I think I'll end on, uh, I think I'll skip one of the barman poems, but um, my pamphlet that's coming out with Bad Betty next year is called The Barman, and it's just poems about this imaginary character called The Barman, who's never really named. Um, it's a, it's just, it sort of like traces their relationship, but um, uh, it's about a lot of things, but it's also about like the barman being this white dude, um, this white straight dude who doesn't quite get the speaker. Um, barman on tour, two. The barman and I go to China on holiday. 
Things are getting serious, but not so serious that I tell my very distant family we're there. For the first time in his life, the barman is getting stared at in the street. Two men ask for a selfie with him in the Bird's Nest Stadium. On the underground, teens in school uniforms openly point and laugh. He's never felt so handsome and strange. When we kiss, I can feel him smiling, light as a blimp. The morning I venture out for breakfast alone, a shopkeeper stops me to say I'm beautiful. I guess from her smile and my little Chinese that she's saying I'm mixed. Back at the hotel, I relay this to the barman and he laughs. He says, I think you're beautiful too, and switches on the TV. And I'll just finish with this final one. Monsieur le barman. The barman is learning French. I already speak French and he knows how I love to tell people what they're doing wrong. His accent is particularly awful, but you really have to live somewhere to pick that kind of thing up. It's Tuesday night and the pub's empty. The barman sprays half a pint of Sprite into a glass and asks what remember is in French. Ce souvenir de, I say. It's reflexive and irregular, like veneer. Too complicated for me, he says, opening a pack of cheese and onion crisps. Je parle français et pas contourné. Ma grand-mère ne savait pas les que contourné. Que quoi ça? I want to say all this to the barman, but I think it would be too much. So instead we do verb drills. Je suis, tu es, il, elle, on, et, et c'est facile. Thanks, or merci. <laughs> wow, that's, that's wonderful, Helen. Uh, thank you so much for, um, for those poems, but I, I love the performative aspects of, of the poetry as well and, and the persona of, of Le Barman's, uh, go, you know, girlfriend. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, thanks so much for, for your reading. Um, and we'll turn to Jay um, now. Um, so welcome, Jay. Um, Jay, uh, Jay Ji Ying is a Chinese Scottish poet uh, and MFA student at Brown University. He's the author of three poetry pamphlets, Wedding Beast in 2019. He was shortlisted for the Satir uh, Saltier Cullum MacDonald Award, uh, Cartabasis 2020, um, is, is a winner of the new, the winner of the New, a New Poets Prize uh, and Travesty 58 forthcoming in 2022. He's a contributing editor for the White Review, a reviewer of the Poetry Foundation and a mentor for the Ledbury Emerging Poetry Critics Programme. Thanks so much for being here with us this evening, Jay. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for coming. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I, like everyone else, will, will also share my screen receive a poem yes amazing so all of these poems um come from the forthcoming pamphlet of mine which is called travesty 58 and it's forthcoming from spam press next year and it's a pamphlet which is sort of dealing with my interaction with the Chinese text, the I Ching, which is the, but particularly the English translation, the fairly hegemonic um, I Ching translated by Richard Wilhelm and Carl Jung, and sort of looking at how to sort of deconstruct that text. Um, so this poem is called Resolutions. I wake only to stay in bed again, Decide every minor error of mine can still remain broken in its wildness. Nights of loss now end peacefully and never with restless sediment. Certainly, I think I no longer feel alone. Update on security incident is the subject of these siren emails. So it seems ghosts keep trying to hack the university's global networks. And they dream about our sacred technicians working all around the anxious clock deep breathing, remain vigilant. I remind myself I am the translation machine. Excavated, I am multiplying. This morning, it must have snowed even if I did not witness it. The inert world seemed buried with an off-white energy yet to be exploited. 
So I made a gambit to get my body out of there, a homecoming in disguise, my old return. Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury aligned a few weeks ago without me even knowing. Yet I still perceived it. I think I slept right through it, like a final rehearsal before death. No matter how many rooms I give my heroic molecules, they refuse to fall in line, to de-territorialize. I will be honest, I am excited to know what aporias you will be planning soon. I praise the tenantless sun. This year I long to be both at home and not. Wet with words, my fingers within language, then without. One childhood aspiration was to project myself into the past whenever the classics can console, but not enough. But still, I wanted to end by walking backwards, trace slower circles in my back garden. In the distance, beyond the steel mountains, I hear a train slip back into the platform of its modern station with a click. That snap of setting a pen's cap back on, the hands of a train are lifted straight up as if to say, okay, you got me, I admit it. I yield my tempo, let us call it a day, just let me surrender. Let me surrender over all my worlded goods to you. So the pamphlet that I'm reading from is takes hexagram 58 as its sort of subject. Um, hexagram 58 is joy, the joyous lake. And so this pamphlet is me working out what does it mean to feel joy, to be joyous? What is Asian affect? And so this poem is a sort of long poem. Um, it's titled after a collection by the American poet George Oppen, who was an objectivist poet, but also famous, particularly famous in 1930 for abandoning poetry, moving to Mexico and um, renouncing art in favor for political activism. And so I wrote this poem having recently just moved to the US and I was thinking a lot about anti-Asian violence during COVID. I was thinking about personas. So like Helen's barman, the persona for this poem is the mechanical Turk, which people might know as the sort of fake chess playing machine in the 18th century which was not mechanical, not a cyborg, but actually had a little, a small person inside. This is called This in Which. Joy, when the Turk can distinguish white from black, from yellow, from brown, and is rewarded by not being disassembled. Joy, when the Turk is gift wrapped in a pulsating envelope. Joy when the Turk is wired up to the moon and its moaning electrical charges. Joy when he is unable to decide whether to move his remaining knight a certain route to give the impression of human error so as to keep the game going. Joy when everything is closed at night except for the Turk's updating an open body, when the Turk is forced to play a game or two of chess at midnight, when the opponent is nothing but moonlight on the chair of a dead man, when he knows that when we install them, the chairs, people will know that they, the ghosts, are there. When the Turk's head is being rebooted and what falls out is an unreadable digital slime that squirms like white ink on the white page, that dances like white milk on the white stage, that shuffles like white wine in the white cage that is nearly completed. Joy in the morning with no opponents, so the Turk tries to write about the white squirrels outside. Joy in the morning with no opponents. So the Turk dreams of publishing his poetry in literary journals named after minor states. Joy in not ever knowing where to begin, but always making the same first move. Joy in how different writing was from chess. Joy in doubting that difference. Was it really all that different? Joy in the Turk thinking he, like the squirrels, were non-native not being sure of it, in only being able to have minor hunches, something he was programmed with, in realizing that a picture might have been doctored whenever a robot plays pretend for the cameras of the visitors, 
joy in coming up with imagery of how the squirrel's black beady eyes look like roving surveillance cameras who in turn look like international Chinese students who in turn look like smooth robots who in turn look like chess pieces when viewed from above on a screen. Joy as the Turk successfully writes a sonnet crown about how nature might one day overwrite his wildness. Joy as the Turk mapped out every analytical voter as if on a night's tour. Joy as the Turk generated a poetics of Myrmidon. Joy as the Turk notices that in five years, the number of security cameras on campus has tripled as he wonders if the invasive squirrel population has tripled in five years also. As he thinks that their fat eyes are like marbles, black hemispherical shells, as they do not even process for students as human, as they eat out of the Turk's hands, as they nibble away at the Turk's skin, as they, the living squirrels, boldly wonder what he, the dead Turk, was, why he, the mechanical Turk, smells of gear lubricant and overheating printers running dangerously low on ink and electric toothbrush charging stations. Joy as they collectively decide that the Turk is just another camera in a skin shell. Joy if he has a free moment to muse about automatons on patrol. Joy if he writes about the housing he is permitted to occupy. Joy if he manages to write an epic about China's surveillance apparatuses. Joy if he truly comprehends that of the world's top 20 cities for closed circuit television per 1,000 people, 18 are in China. Joy if this can really be true? Joy if he gets a research grant to beat locals at chess from Taiyuan, Wuxi, Changsha, Beijing, Hangzhou, Kunming, Qingdao, Xiamen, Harbin, Suzhou, Shanghai, Wulongqi, Chengdu, Shenzhen, Jinan, Shenyang, Hefei, Tianjin. Joy if there will be many white flashes and celebratory victory dinners. Joy if he, the guest, receives an ornate chess set as a gift. The white pieces are made from a rare ash and the black pieces, well, Turk, you don't want to know what they, the native compounds, are made from. Just please take them back home with you. Joy to the article the Turk read earlier that said, Brown University has deployed one surveillance camera for every 18 members of the community. Joy to College Hill being placed somewhere between Wuxi and Changsha. Joy to catastrophic cartography. Joy to barely not noticing them, to really having to try to find them. To the story that once the campus emergency fire warning system malfunctioned, ringing every hour for the Turks' attention, the scream originating from a space between buildings, to the technical fault, the recording played on a loop. Joy to the uneasy feeling that, in reality, in contrast to whatever was being broadcasted, the exact opposite scenario it was trying to disavow was in fact true and happening presently elsewhere, not too far from wherever the Turk, the dead Turk, was listening. Joy to the similar false sense of security whenever a vehicular siren moves close and far away from you, making you think the tragedy has just ended. Joy to realizing it hasn't, and you have just stayed still long enough for the event to move further and further out of your sensory perceptions. Joy for the voice of a celestial robot, for the voice of an angelic chess grandmaster, for the voice of a sacred technician, for the voice of an impossible guide, for the voice of a travesty generator. Joy for this is only a test. Or if this was an actual emergency, you would have been provided with additional information. For the emergency could have been anything, a stolen laptop, some homophobic graffiti, a cruel prank where someone once shoved a book that was too heavy, like word gum, into the Turk's gears. Joy for the past weekend, where the Turk visited the grave of Elizabeth Parbody daughter of the Plymouth Pilgrims, John Alden and Priscilla Mullen, for she was the first white woman born in New England. For perhaps she, this white woman, too, was another variation of him, the blank Turk, 
all microchips and charging cables and sprouting in the ground, churning earth and metallic worms, a little too unreal, yet still mourned for, wept over. Joy for the rainwater oozing through clumps of toxic dirt, wanting to rejuvenate the nationalized rotten carcasses. Joy where the thunderstorm earlier in the morning threatened to blow up a distant country. Where the Turk took a photograph of a squirrel watching over the grave of that first white woman like a prison guard. We're not far from the road white wild garlic grew. We're not far from the white wild garlic, a little row of American flags planted in the fleshy plot, shook with a violent ecstasy in the breeze like empty pages. Joy where the Turk wrote down a little code for himself in the car ride back to the city. To tell you the truth, I was never very good at chess. Well, yesterday the Turk dreamt that he, like Oppen, abandoned poetry and moved to Mexico instead to make cabinets amongst other wooden things. Whether the Turk applied the varnish that would make a body water resistant but never fireproof. Joy where the Turk could not remember who he was making this object for. Joy with a Turk carrying his detached body parts in his arms climbed inside the box as if it were a coffin. With a Turk locked the secret space from the inside where he rebooted himself. Joy after the fire began to fuse first the Turk's hinges, then the keyhole in the box. Joy after everything melted down back into its polished raw materials after what was left of the Turk was only two molten puddles, one black, one white, two lakes already leaching into the foreign ground. Joy after the squirreling data handlers arrive at the scene and they realize that there is nothing to be done, no body to be found, no mind to be saved. And I think it was, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jay. That was an amazing, sustained performance of a, a wonderful long poem. Um, and I'm glad someone mentioned um, Anna Ginsberg's How, because um, that's what I thought about when I first read the poem as well. And I was also thinking as you were reading it, actually, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. Um, so it kind of the, that kind of incantory um, aspect of it. Um, and also the, the political irony as well was, is, is kind of right in that, that kind of, American poetic tradition. So um, thank you so much for that, Jay. So we, we've got quite a lot of time now, so we might kind of lengthen the discussion between um, the, the Jay, Helen and Will and myself uh, to about 20 minutes, and then we can also turn to the audience um, here today um, for the last 20 minutes um, of, of the event this evening. So um, if it's all right, um, if I could start off with a question uh, and, and, ju and just a kind of observation, really. Um, so um, I'm really glad, Jay, that you you mentioned um, affect, and and uh, I'm really interested in affect as well, and what what it means to feel Chinese British or what it means to feel Chinese ness. And I think so much of the poetry that all three of you read today is engaging with that. How does it feel to be Chinese uh, when obviously um, that there are certain embodied versions of being Chinese as well, but there's the kind of interior psychic self that is. To what extent is it Chinese? Um, and linked to that question, that point, I think I wanted to think a little bit about form, because all of you are writing poetry of, of, of actually very quite different form and style. Um, but broadly speaking, I suppose, um, um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about affect, you know, so how does it feel to be Chinese and, and what kind of form captures that affect most effectively? Um, so for, for example, um, something that you, we could maybe talk about is is what kind of um, literary influences can help you think about that form. So um, whether it's kind of more kind of I guess Western forms of uh, literary um, influences. So Tennyson, you know, in the case of Will, um, um, Jay, you you didn't read Endymion, which is one of my favorite poems from Keats. Um, so, and I know that, 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 you know, that was kind of influential for you as well. Um, and then Helen, you, you, you know, the, the, the Mulan references that you mentioned as well. 
And so what, what are your literary influences and how does that kind of impact form um, and the way in which that form then is, is reflective of a kind of affect um, around being Chinese or and or Chinese British? A really complex question. So bringing in kind of um, hybridity, form, and you know, and 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 in and, and, and different kind of contexts as well. Um, I, I'm not sure if, um, yeah, who'd like to go go first? It, it, it doesn't really matter really. Uh, or if you um, want to take turns or. Uh, Will, maybe if you stick up your hand can, or, yeah, uh, yeah, Will, you go, you go first and then, yeah. I can, I can try. It's okay. really, really complicated. And I feel like I'm gonna say something really stupid because yeah, my only caveat is that I, I'm not an intelligent person. I'm just, <laughs> uh, I have only written some poems, but I was uh, recently um, recommended uh, this book by Jenny Lau, who's a really good food writer called um, The Sons of the Yellow Emperor by Lin Pan. And um, she, and, and it, it made me, she talk, it's about the kind of like history of the Chinese diaspora uh, relevant to this. and. It, it strikes me in it that there is a particular Chinese affect, which you couldn't say. So speaking, someone whose mum is Chinese Indonesian, which you couldn't say of Indonesia. So Indonesia is a nation state, and like not na nation states has very particular political history. You know, it came into existence because of Dutch settler mm -hmm. colonialism, and then was became Indonesia in, after the Second World War. You know, and so there's like a kind of like false. Well, there's a there's an it's an imagined community. There's an imagined community. Whereas China is like an imperial state going back longer than any like Western state, which has always had a very like coherent idea of Chineseness, which at various points in its history has been so important to like um, you know recalling China, you know Chinese citizens from abroad, and which you know in the 20th century was really important at different points, like claiming this idea that everyone is Chinese and all over the world, which actually only I mean, occurred to me that that made sense of why I've often felt more comfortable thinking of myself as Chinese than as Indonesian, even though I like, I mean, my mum is, you know, is Indonesian, basically, like her passport is Indonesian, probably speaking Indonesian, like that's, a, that's her like culture, but somehow that was a harder identity for me to claim. Um, I don't know, just, I don't know that, okay, I feel like that's, that's quite a lot already, so maybe I shouldn't, yeah, but maybe that there's like an, an element of like imperialism to the to the Chinese effort. Anyway, yeah, that's that's all. Does anyone else want to add something? I don't want to. I don't just want to speak. But of course, your 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 heritage, your literary heritage, is also English, right? Hence the reference to, to Tennyson and, and Lady of Shalott. You, that, that's another imperial culture that you can uh, attach yourself to as well. Um, do you, do you think of yourself as kind of you, you know? Yeah, these are two very dominant cultures in, in, in global history, Britain and, and China. Yeah. To be fair, that, that, that little reference, I, I kind of completely forgot about it because it is basically a joke. I, I can't even remember what how the Lady of Shalott <laughs> goes. <laughs> so I feel kind of bad about that. Um, Tennyson is so funny because he's like one of those English poets that like nobody really reads anymore. Oh, except Charge of the Light Brigade, which is obviously heinous. Um, but I, yeah, I feel like I am probably quite like a, most of my, yeah, I like write through reading. Um, and so obviously a lot of what I read is informed by the, the English language <laughs> literary tradition. It's like impossible to yeah. go around. Or for me, the only way around is, is through, it's through just trying to like ingest as much of it or the like, uh, you know, it would, yeah, I couldn't. I can't, I can't claim any other tradition. Either. Yeah, that, well, that's an interesting point. I think, um, well, you know, what, what traditions can you claim? What traditions do you have a right to claim? What traditions do people think you have a right to claim as well? I mean, all those questions are, I think, really key. Um, Jay, Jay um, any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. A big question. Yeah, have, big you know, question. Relationship between affect and form. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, the poem I didn't read, Endymion, was sort of me riffing on Keats, but also actually thinking through more sort of Eastern ways of sort of thinking about beauty and sort of, you know, trying to sort of fuse the two in a way. 
And I guess similar to Will, you know, this idea of tradition and lineage, like, you know, I was born in the UK, English was my first language, and I sort of grew up reading the texts which were usually expected of someone in this country in, in this way. Um, and that's sort of, it's so impossible to, to sort of um, forget that, you cannot. You can sort of learn more, but it's actually quite hard to unlearn it. Of all, you know, um, some, I think people would say, hey, perhaps you should unlearn it. But for me, it's sort of just always a point of then reading more. And so, for example, I came to Chinese literature quite, quite late, you know, um, discovering like all these amazing sort of poets and writers. And now I'm sort of at this middle junction where I'm trying to sort of incorporate both, but not ascribing myself to any one nationalism, any one sort of camp, right? Because um, the this is a hybrid in-between space, you know, Homi Baba's third space, right? This is a sort of place I would like to keep occupying. I think I think that point about um, you know the the inheritance of a certain kind of poetry or literature and the way that that's filtered through a particular kind of racialized consciousness is really key. Because I, when I read Keats, for example, um, you know when I encounter an image like her lilied hand. I think, well, that's not my hand. <laughs> my hand is not lilied in the same way. It's not pure and white. But yet the affect in the poem is so, so it resonates so powerfully with me. Uh, and it's interesting that, you know, that that poem maybe doesn't include the kind of affective registers that someone of my race would, would mm -hmm. be privileged um, to kind of, um, I guess, uh, feel or, or perceive. So there's, there's, there's that kind of like tension between the, the affect that English literary tradition kind of assumes uh, and the way that we might insert a racialized kind of um, lens onto it, um, or, you know, whether that's British, Chinese or, or anything else. Um, you know, as I was thinking through that, that idea, I was thinking, so what if you, you, you were of a different color to being white? Can, you know, does that lilied hand still apply to you? Does that the love that surrounds all that poetry still, you know, still affect you in the same way? Um, so, so I, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in literary tradition and uh, English literary tradition, particularly, and, and who it excludes and who mm -hmm. might appropriate it in different ways. Um, yeah, Helen, any thoughts about um, literary traditions um, and the kind of cross cultural influences you might have? Um, what well, obviously you mentioned Mulan in in your poem. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think all three of us are coming from this from a kind of a similar perspective in that we've, you know, studied English literature and, and been um, through the English, edu well, the British education system. Um, and so we all have these sort of colonial um, reference points. Yeah, um, I don't. I, it, yeah, so I, when I went to university, I did a module in Intro to Chinese Culture, which obviously was taught by a white man. <laughs> um, but I don't speak Chinese, and I I just remember it. It just all felt so um, quite alien to me. Like, I, I didn't grow up learning really about Chinese history or really Chinese folklore, Um some of my other Chinese friends, like BBCs, did, um, but I, my mum, just isn't as engaged in in that kind of thing. So it it felt so, yeah, different to me, it, as if I was a white person um, learning about these things for the first time. But then it also felt really weird being in that classroom, being I don't know if there were, I can't remember if there were any other non-white people in that class. It was quite a small group, um, but. Yeah, I think there were, but like the idea of me just because my mum is Chinese, uh, really like th this idea that I should know more um, about about that heritage, but I just didn't slash don't. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Jay, do you read in Chinese and do you ever write in Chinese? Like, No, no I mean, my, my reading skills are like atrocious, um, <laughs> like many people, like BBC. And it's so like, hard, Chinese poetry is so hard. <laughs> but I, and I don't write, I, you know, but I, I've, people have asked me that before and it's just like, 
but it's just two different parts of my brain really you know I don't know if I even could write if I did write in Chinese I don't think the poems would come out the same in any way as my poems come out in English right um, not merely because of the linguistic differences between the two languages but something to do with the affect in a way right something to do with um, the interiority um, mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's interesting, you know, Helen, you mentioned, you know, growing up thinking you're white and, and you're obviously a mixed race. Uh, and I'm not, but I grew up in the literary tradition of Enid Blyton, you know, um, and I always thought, you know, I was that white I, or, and, you know, famous five. And I was that little girl playing in the, you know, in this English mm-hmm. wood, wood, you know, wooden landscape, even though I grew up in tropical Singapore, you know, but <laughs> the kind of the imaginative projection of an English self. Um, is, a, you know, is a consistent colonial trope um, through the kind of schoolhouse of empire. Uh, and, and I'm really interested in that, the way in which, um, I guess, post-colonial um, citizens grow up with that kind of, um, that kind of internalization of a kind of white, white affective self that gets filtered through literature. Um, and I think, you know, it, it happened to an entire generation of, of, of people the same age as me, because there weren't for example, example, English language books necessarily telling us about Chinese culture. That at you know, the point in time in which I was reading, if you if you had an English education, you read English books. <laughs> um, but but that kind of meant that your imaginative realm was was filtered through an Englishness which was always displaced. Um, I thought that, you know, I think that's that's really kind of really interesting. Um, I was wondering if we can move on to uh, another question that I had, which is about heritage. Uh, so, and, and heritage is a really interesting term, I think, because it kind of intimates a kind of biological inheritance. So like it's in your DNA, like, you know, you inherit certain things through genes, but there's also obviously cultural uh, where you have a bit more agency so you can choose your heritage. Um, and it's also linked to notions of the past, um, but, and also kind of an imagine and collective kind of projected future, right? So, uh, you know, you, you think through heritage in order to conceive of, of a kind of future. Um, so I think that's kind of, that, that kind of idea of heritage is really central to, to, to what you, you're doing. And, and, and there's kind of mixed, de- definitively like mixed forms of heritage that are taking place in your, your poem. So, um, you know, on the one hand, I think, you know, so for example, Will, there is the, the reference to kind of popular culture in terms of Flash Gordon, but then there is um, also a kind of um, acknowledgement of a kind of Dutch ancestral past. Um, so th- these are very, very different cultural heritages. Um, you know, ha- how do you position yourself within the idea of heritage, which, you know, as I mentioned, is both biological and cultural. Um, so do you consider yourself, the three of you, um, inheriting a kind of global heritage? Are you, do you think of yourself as you know, inheriting parts of lots of different cultures? Uh, so I'm thinking of Jay as well in terms of you know, the reference to um, the I Ching, but also in your work to classical antiquity, there's, there's quite a lot of references to, uh, to, to, to the, the kind of traditional classics. Uh, and then for Helen, you, you know, language plays such a key role in, in the way in which I think heritage is conceived. Um, do you do you think of yourself as kind of inheriting a, a kind of European form of language and all that it, it, it uh, kind of comes with, or, or is it, um, you know, wh- how does linguistic heritage play into into what you you write? Because you obviously write in different languages as well. There's French, Mandarin, Cantonese, English uh, in, in your writing, and that that kind of playfulness between linguistic registers, I found really, really interesting. So I'm wondering, you know, could you say a little bit about heritage? You know, what, what does heritage mean for you in all its different kind of forms? Um, and do you think of yourself, is, is heritage a kind of um, anachronistic word in some ways to think about um, what, what you're doing? Is, is, it, is it something that, is, it, is cosmopolitanism more the kind of spirit you're, 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 you're um, writing within um because heritage is such a is such a loaded word now i think in in today's kind of climate you know uh with the cultural wars and 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 so on uh so i'm wondering you know is i i think your your poetry is in some ways a rejection of of heritage as a kind of term um 
it, you know, it's it's something else. Your poetry is doing something else altogether. So I'm wondering what what you what you think about about that kind of fault line. Um, hmm, interesting. Um, I I heard I was listening to a podcast recently um, where they had um, someone who was mixed race, I think Chinese and English, or maybe Malaysian Chinese and English, um, on, and she was very adamant that she was not um, half Chinese, half English. She was Chinese and English, so sort of this bothness of identity. And I really like that. Um, don't know. I might start using that because the whole idea of like half quarters, eighths, sixteenths gets ridiculous. Because you know, how far back do you go? What? None of us is purely one thing. I mean, like some people are what English, you know, from Cornwall going back hundreds of years, sure. But most of us are some kind of mix of a variety of things and then if you know if you go back far enough are you French are you Germanic are you Norse um yeah I think that's that's a great point I think all all three of you write poetry which really resist that kind of classification which we're so keen you know to to kind of attach ourselves to I mean we all are familiar with that question so where are you really from you know um and and you're you're absolutely right, Helen. We we are all hybrid in in, in ways that we, you know, ourselves don't quite understand. But um, but but people are very resistant to that kind of idea of a kind of global heritage or or kind of hybridness, which is inherent in every single person. You know, the the the, the signifiers of, of of race, I think, are so powerful uh, in in today's kind of um, the way in which um, we kind of. Um, interpolate or, or think about people's relationship to us uh, it's, it's really difficult to overcome whereas I think in in the poetry that you've all three of you have written it, it you really really resist that um, it's you know it's it's some ways the poetry that you write is, is of our time uh, because it's it's who everyone is um, uh, any thoughts from Jay or, or, or Will before we turn to the audience thanks Lisa yeah, I mean, I, I, heritage is something I'm really interested in. And I I'm glad you picked on this idea of antiquity because for a few years now, I've been obsessed with Homer. And I, I wish I wasn't because it's quite sort of nerdy and almost sad to be so into the Odyssey still, you know, many thousands of years later. But, you know, there was a line in, in the poem, the first poem I read, which I borrowed from Derek Walcott, the classics can console, but not enough. And it's enough that I'm so interested in. No. Um, and in terms of the heritage question, I, I, I do, I am attracted by this sort of cosmopolitanism, but that's not very new. You know, I think that was sort of in, in vogue, you know, even in the 60s, 70s, right? When all the academic departments were sort of thinking, oh, let's think about globalism, planetarity, uh, cosmopolitanism. Um, and I, I know there are sort of critiques of that, but I, I do like this idea that, um, especially as someone who, for, for me, I never actually studied English literature. So when I was reading, at the age when I was reading sort of um, poetry and, and serious literature, serious, you know, I was reading like stuff in translation from Russia, from Japan, from Latin America. So there wasn't for me the sense of this national, nationalistic sort of canon. I was building my own canon, right? And, you know, it was sort of like, uh, what's that? You know, what, what, what's that quote by, by Wittgenstein? It's like, you know, the limits of my world are the limits of language. So, you know, it's not, it's not borders per se. It's, it's what I could get my hands on. That for me was my heritage. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a really um, eloquent response. And if we think about it, um, you know, you know, almost everyone is composed of, of multiple sites of affiliation, you know, um, whether it's affective, intellectual, or cultural. Um, um, but it, we, I think we, we, we're living in a time at the moment where that, that idea is being really resisted uh, and challenged. Um, Will, we, we, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I guess um, to give like a slightly more uh, downbeat take. I, I just, it just makes me think, um, 
yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't really feel like I, I do have a heritage because I don't feel like my mum ever really had a clear sense of heritage. Like I mentioned that poem, there's, I mean, there's a long history of persecution of Chinese people in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And I think for her, her identity is a real um, site of trauma. And it was for her, her parents as well. And I think if I carry anything, it's not a sense of, you know, a place or a, you know, a sense of belonging. It's actually that sense of um, rejection and confusion. And yeah, it's only, yeah, it's only recently I've really come to kind of realize that how the extent to which that gets, that gets passed down and, you know, and, and because we're just trained to think of just in these like larger, you know, concepts of like race and nation, you kind of, but I feel like often like it's feelings that get passed down in families, like feelings of belonging or not belonging. And yeah, I've never, yeah, and that's, I've never really, never really had that sense of belonging. I really felt like I had a, a heritage I can claim. Yeah. Um, no, that's not that's not downbeat at all. I think. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, it's not because I think. Well, I very much relate to that. Um, you know, I um, I find it so. My my grandmother doesn't speak a language that I speak, for example. You mm. know, and that's partially to do with colonialism. It's partially to do with you know family aspirations that my brother and I had to be you know English educated, whereas my my grandmother, you know, was illiterate. Um, she only spoke Teochew. She only spoke the dialect of Mandarin. Uh, and so my dad had to always translate for us. Um, you know, and that's a really difficult thing to explain to someone who has a coherent sense of heritage, you know, whether that's linguistic or cultural. So, um, you know, I, I think that, that what you're saying is, um, you know, affects, you know, every colonial nation. Um, and that's a vast part of the world will <laughs> so I don't, I, it's the colonial it's the post-colonial condition what you're describing i think in some yeah. ways. i guess another thing i was thinking about that we're so we're all part of this um scheme the library critics for poets of poets of color and in one uh, event we were talking at the beginning about um bios and whether we put um like just is a writer or is a i guess in so my case like writer of chinese inclusion and british um heritage or something like that and yeah and it was and it was interesting I think like quite a people feel very strongly about it like understandably and I've always um taken my cue from a poet I really love um Mei Mei Bersenberger who is <clears throat> she, who always consciously defines herself as um Asian American and always says in her bios I've noticed I assume she's choosing to say this that she was born in Beijing but grew up in the US. And I think it's interesting because her work doesn't at all reflect that. I mean, unless you're like, you know, sifting through it for, for little, you know, for clues. It's because she's like classics, you know, she's thought of as like a language poet. So it's doing a lot of like interesting, it, it's, a, it's often quite like abstract. So I think she, you know, she's making a choice to like mark the text herself with that. And I think that's something I, I also feel is important to like, choose to do to say even though I have a really like conflicted relationship to all of those different markers or don't feel like they really describe me yeah 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 ab absolutely yeah yeah they, they can be quite liberating but also quite kind of um limiting uh, I think mm. there's I, I was thinking today uh, before I introduced myself um I, I I thought of saying that I'm Chinese Singaporean and then I decided that I wasn't going to say that <laughs> because that you know would, would create certain assumptions about who I am and where I was born and you know um, and, and so on um right we um I was wondering if we can turn now you know to the audience if um if you have any questions or comments um you can either put your hand up um and Jinhao if you'd be kind enough to um follow the chat actually I can follow the chat as well if you could kind of um see if anyone uh, has their hands raised um and maybe just mention their name and then they can uh, they can unmute themselves and yeah, we'll speak. do. Okay, thanks so much, Jinha. So feel free to, you know, um, ask questions or, or make a comment to any of the poets today or to myself. 
Um, and feel free to use just the chat function or just to raise your hand. Any, any thoughts or questions or comments? Oops. I, uh, I followed the chat. There was no one asked while the reading was going on. So. Okay. Um, Jenny, do you have uh, any questions? Yeah. Can I ask maybe something then? I, I'm quite interested in the fact that, the fact that like, um, you, yeah, it was just so many lovely ideas. And so, um, like, there's um, a certain sense of fluidity in your language and, and, and men all your language, um, poetic language and forms um, in terms of expressing yourself, do you think like, you know, how do you kind of come up, you know, how does it come about? Do you think it's because of your, the way you think, or is it like, how do you think like, you know, do you actively think about your, your, your consciousness or your subconscious when you write? And because I feel like, you know, for example, Jay, I actually have Helen, well, you put your kind of, it, it travels so, you know, in, in such a broad sense and kind of keep going back and forth places and people. Yeah, I, I, I wonder how that comes about. Like, how do you tie things together? Like there's just so many strands of thoughts. That's interesting because I wouldn't say that I write in a fluid way. I feel more like that I'm hopping about from place to place and it's not fluid it's kind of whatever the opposite is like staccato um but i guess how you, I, I can see how you can read that as as fluid in in, in kind of a different sense of the word um yeah i don't know it's it's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't, really, I haven't really got anything more considered to say than that. But like, I guess it's just about trying to not, for me, it's about not um, getting too attached to one particular viewpoint and thinking about where else, from where else this could be seen. Well, I guess, I guess, oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh. Jay was answering. Jay, Jay, go ahead, Jay. Well, I guess for me, you know, I don't know how others feel. Like when I write, I feel that the, the sort of subject of my poems, the sort of characters, I view them more as fictional characters. They're not very autobiographical in, in any way, really. Um, perhaps the ones I, I read today were the most out of all I've written so far. Um, I view it more as a sort of like, you know, I don't know if anyone's played Dungeons and Dragons or like uh, World of Warcraft. I, 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 I was saying this in my last event um, a few days ago that, you know, I view my characters as like, as like these little avatars, which I can then send out on quests, you know, and therefore there's no limits to where they can travel to in theory. Um, but then obviously the sort of other side of it is you also don't want them to be embody too much of that pioneering colonial mentality which is something I'm also trying to think about as well. You know, how do you create a sort of um, ethical, poetical avatar of yourself and then to, to put into the world? Will, any thoughts? On, um, on fluidity. Yeah. Um, and, and combining lots of disparate elements in a kind of coherent coherent narrative i guess yeah god i don't i don't know i don't <laughs> yeah there is no coherent narrative <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, yeah exactly i have no idea what the, the coherence is yeah, I, I don't know i don't really know yeah just i just th throw stuff together in fact i was just thinking in relation maybe this relates to my answer to nadia's question in the um she's talking about um what language do you find yourself yeah in? And yeah. so, I mean, I, like, really sadly, um, monolingual, though I, like, know little, like, fragment, you know, snippets of other, other languages. And, but I think when I'm trying to write, I feel like the language I'm trying to capture is, is not, like, is a, like, maybe a language of, like, is a, like, a sense feeling or a memory. 
Um, and so I don't really think, I, I don't really think of myself even as like, well, at least the way I'm trying to write now, I don't even think of myself as writing in English. I'm just trying to like write in a, in, uh, in feeling. <laughs> yeah, and, and, to, and to capture, capture, a, uh, uh, capture things that you know I think can't be can't be captured in language often you know that's a struggle of you know all, all yeah. kind of creative writing isn't it to, to kind of translate in some ways what what can't quite be captured and pinpointed in language in language mm-hmm. um I, Helen this question might might be um for you as well about <laughs> multilingualism because you you did use a number of languages in your in your, your poetry and, and the question is what language do you find yourself thinking in I mean, the whole point of the last poem is like, I don't speak Cantonese. I have learned French through the education system in the UK and university and then living in France for seven months, uh, which I've never lived in any part of China. Um, And so I have a much, you know, like when I lived in France, I was thinking in French, um, not anymore because that was like five years ago. Um, I always think in English. Um, I don't really have another language that's that accessible to me anymore. Um, But yeah, I I think the reason that the language comes up so much in in what I'm writing is because I always, I mean, I love learning languages. Like I've just started learning Portuguese, (laughs) Um, but I have never been a, I don't speak Cantonese, which is my mother's language. And I think that has created... um, like it's a language barrier between us um she speaks amazing English but she herself feels that she doesn't she still feels very much um alienated by English and my parents struggled to communicate a lot of the time um and so I think I always feel like if I I could speak Cantonese my mum and I would have this completely different relationship um but I will never know because turns out all Cantonese teachers are not very good. <laughs> At least all of the ones, the many, many times, the many years I've spent like paying for Cantonese classes or whatever. If anyone has any recommendations, hit me up. Um, <laughs> but like, I just, I need verb tables. I mean, obviously Chinese doesn't have verb tables, but you know, I need, I need to learn the grammar and I want a systematic way of doing it. But apparently Cantonese is just... They don't. They don't do that. <laughs> it's it, that's a really interesting point, Helen, about the kind of gendered nature of language as well, especially between mothers and daughters in Chinese culture. You know, the the kind of inherited uh, cultural mores and norms that get passed through, specifically Chinese languages uh, or Chinese dialects. Right, there are certain phrases or words that you know. I think I grew up, which were which are a specific resonance only in the dialect form. That the English translation would never resonate in as pernicious a way often they're like, like quite nasty things <laughs> that were said uh, in Cantonese or Hokkien um okay Jay 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 because you you mentioned briefly before about uh about you know being asked whether you write in Chinese and how, how does that make you feel is it something that annoys you <laughs> you want to... well I mean I'm sure everyone has examples you know I think in readings, we've all had bad questions, which were, you know, thinly yes. disguised comments, right, um, from certain people who, you know, and actually one of my professors here at Brown said it in a really great way that, um, to really badly paraphrase her, she said, you know, people come to the readings with the questions they know they want to ask you, and nothing you can read or say at the reading will change that you know, question that they, they have wanted to ask because they have you in their mind and it's, it's often visual, right? Yes, yeah. So she is a sort of middle-aged, black, overweight, African-American woman. And she says that even before she steps into the room, the people have already made, they've put the language in her that they think they want to hear, you know? So I sometimes feel that similarly, we... You know, I've had definitely had that. So, you know, I, I may have read for like 20 minutes and then someone will ask, ask an audience question, which will just be totally unrelated, you know, or be just so goes against what I've just read. But I don't, it just, it's, it's really quite scary, actually. You know, that sort of the work that we do 
doesn't always travel, you know, that one meter or two meters in person to the, re to the reader, to the audience. Um, I mean, that didn't answer your question at all, but <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. I think this is it, interesting, right? It does mm. because I, you know, my earlier question about inheritance was also about biology. It's about the 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 the, the racial signification which people mark you with, right? Uh, and what that what that kind of makes them assume about you, and and sometimes how that cannot be transcended in their minds, um, you know. And, yeah. and I've often, you know, I think we've all been in that position. Um, so one last question from the audience, um, from Nina, um, to, to draw things to a close this evening. Um, this is a question for, for all of you. Um, where do you draw your creative energy from at the moment? So uh, perhaps what, what you're writing now, has it changed recently or um, have you um, gained inspiration from reading poetry or from other types of art or um or neither of those things or yeah basically your poetic influences at the moment that's a really nice question to end on um in terms of what you're writing now um hey, will should we go back to you and then helen and then jay um okay uh, yeah that's really nice yeah that's nice when like to end on some recommendations maybe um i haven't been um writing or reading very much, very much because i i guess i just finished uh, a writing project and i also started a new job in care so i've just been really busy but i did watch a really good i like quite like watching films now especially i mean i've always liked watching films and found them really inspiring um and especially now when you're like super tired and you can only do like a very passive the most passive form of that's been nice. I saw a really good um, Algerian film called Abu Leila, um, that I recommend. And yeah, have I seen any other good films? Okay, that's the main one. And in terms of reading, I've been reading Isabel Weidner's novel, Sterling Carrot Gold. That's really good. And this is a cool book. Maybe I'll recommend this. <laughs> It's um, from the uh, 80s, the Women's Press, a book of, yeah, poetry and prose from the Asian Women Writers Workshop. That's cool. <laughs> Thanks so much, Will. Um, Helen, what, what are some of you, what, what's inspiring you at the moment? Oh my God, nothing. Nothing, okay. <laughs> Dinner. <laughs> Drinks. <laughs> like Will, I've not really been reading or writing very much recently. Well, we're such bad poets. <laughs> um, bad poets, that's a good title for like some kind of collection. I think. Bad poets, yeah. Um, well, Nina, your book. <laughs> I am, I'm halfway through it. Um, but... Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. What have I been reading? I've been reviewing quite a few things recently, which is a completely different experience of reading, I think, because I'm a lot more focused on the analysis and what they're doing than, than, than taking it as inspiration. So I just reviewed um, Cynthia Miller's Honorifics and Sean Wai Kung's um, Sigmund Glass Sahuth, um, both of which are great and very relevant to yeah. everything that we've been speaking about um so if we're doing recommendations i will recommend those um but yeah i don't know i think going back to your earlier question of like my literary heritage um it's like luke kennard all the way down <laughs> so his his uh notes on the sonnets but um really it's it's kane isn't it um so that's yeah, those are my recommendations. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Um, Jay, to, to, to end our evening, anything that we must read or anything that you have read that that is, you know, that you've been bowled over by? Yeah, um, you know, what's been fueling me right now in grad school has been actually, I've been reading a lot of theory and I know theory can be sort of um, quite gatekeeping and, and, and sort of difficult, but actually related to Will's point like a while ago that reading theory really helped me expand my notion of what Chineseness means to me and especially Sinophone studies. So I'm thinking of like 
Sinophone Studies, The Critical Reader. So it's got like Ray Chow, Shu Mei Shi in it. Mm. And then there's also another book called Orientations, yeah. which is about the Asian diaspora. Yeah. And, you know, I haven't finished them, but just even like reading, like, you know, one essay about, you know, how we should be using Sinophones as, as the word instead of Chinese-ness is sort of, you know, I was like, wow, you know, that, that, that actually makes a bit of sense, you know, it, once you're reading through, through, through the arguments. Creatively, I am reading um, Anne Carson's translation of Antigone, which is something I'm sort of trying to really interested in. Yeah. Great. Um, back to back to antiquity. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much, Jay. Um, it just leads me to thank Jay and Helen and Will for you know such wonderful readings and such generous kind of comments and thoughts as well this evening, um, and also to Jin Hao and Jenny for. Um, putting together this, this program and um, this event uh, in particular. And thank you to everyone for your uh, really kind um, uh, thoughts um, and um, your, your appreciation. Uh, and thanks so much for, for being here with us this evening. Um, if Jay and Helen and Will could just stay on the call for just a couple of minutes, that'll be fantastic. Uh, but uh, thanks so much again for coming and I hope you, um, are able to go to a couple more Poetics of Home events um, um, this week. So thanks again and have a good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm.